Recorded? I'm doing it right now. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, welcome everyone to the tax webinar. Um, we have three uh, people here to answer all your questions and to give you what we hopefully will be a very informative uh, discussion. Let me introduce myself first. My name is Eric Lee. I am not only a professor here uh, in the School of Taxation at Golden Gate University, I also am an alumni. I was a student, graduated uh, in the Masters of Tax a long time ago. I think it was in the, 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 the late 90s. Um, but ever since, I've been an adjunct faculty as I worked full time at uh, KPMG, then BDO, and then um, Deloitte. So I have 20 years of real world public accounting tax experience, and now I'm a member of the full time tax faculty. Um, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Rocco to give his introduction. Thank you, Eric. Uh, well, my name is Rocco Lamana. I'm the Director of Administration. And so I do a lot of different things in working with the professors like Eric. I get to work with the wonderful Eric Lee. Uh, and I get to work with a bunch of other faculty in both the School of Tax and the School of Accounting. Uh, and I work with new students such as yourself, answering questions and addressing anything that you might have, helping you get started in our programs. Uh, we do a lot of events and things that you're gonna hear about later on. Um, so I'm a great resource and you will have my contact information at the end so that if you have questions um, that weren't answered or come up later on, you can also email me. Great, and um, would, uh... Let's see, um, Lynn, right, was... Chu, Chu Lynn Chu, would you like... Chu oh, Kim. Chu Kim, I'm sorry. Um, Chu, would you like to introduce yourself briefly? Or you can do it over chat if your mic's not working. I'm gonna... She I might will, have microphone problems, go ahead. Yeah, I will move on and uh, share my slide presentation. Okay, so um, I already kind of gave my background, um, so I'm gonna get right into my presentation. One of the things that I've learned over the years and giving tons of different presentations is it's always important to put myself into your guys' shoes. If I were you, what would I want to know more important than anything else? And to me is what differentiates Golden Gate University? Because there are plenty of places you can get a master's in taxation. Why Golden Gate? What, uh, what, what differentiates us? Um, and it spells out an acronym career, but I'm gonna take it one by one. First, the C in career is classroom experience. I do not like throwing shade at my alma mater, which is Cal Berkeley, but when I was at Berkeley, I would often be in classrooms of size of 80 students, 200 students. I think I've even been in an auditorium of 500 students. And it's, it's simply a different experience than being in a, in a small classroom. Our class size is extremely rare that it ever goes over 25. And usually it's about in that 15 to 20 of you for your work hired classes. Um, and that size allows you not only to get to know your professor, but also your fellow students. And your students come from a broad experience. They, they worked in public accounting. They've They've, uh, they may have worked at the government or in, in corporate, or they may be full-time students. So um, it really creates a rich environment. I know many of you are interested in online. That's true online as well. Um, having a class size of less than 25 allows you to participate in the discussion forums and really have a very rich uh, discussion. Uh, the A is applicability of the material in the real world. It is great to know when I was a student here that what I was learning, I would be able to directly apply to my practice in the real world. Um, we don't use, most of the classes do not use textbooks. Instead, uh, we, you, we teach right out of the Internal Revenue Code uh, and we use case law and regulations. And you know what's cool about that is when I on what was on my job working at uh, the large firms that I worked at, that's what we used when, when researching. I mean, we used the law, we didn't use a textbook. And I think that was, that made me have more confidence uh, in the real world that I was using material that, that 
my partners and senior managers were using. Uh, the first R in career is the relationship with the accounting firms. Um, you know, it's important that you know that you're not just being taught by academics. You're being taught by people who have had real world uh, experience, which kind of goes with the next E, experience industry leading faculty. So our full-time faculty, all of them have tons of experience, often our partners or senior managers uh, in accounting firms like I was. Um, and uh, also our adjunct faculty are, are usually partners and senior managers who are currently working in the field right now. And not only among our faculty do we have a strong experience uh, with the accounting firms, we have advisory um, um, councils, uh, which are littered with people in the accounting firms. Also, a lot of them come in to our campus and recruit and uh, talk at our, our lunch and learns, talk at our leadership series. So, um, and one of the reasons that we have this close relationship with the firms is our location. Both our Seattle campus and our San Francisco campus is downtown. San Francisco, for example, is literally across the street from Deloitte, next door to EY, and at the end of our block is um, KPMG. Pricewaterhouse is about four or five blocks away. Um, extensive uh, tax course offerings. We're gonna, I'm gonna walk you through our required courses and also go through our elective courses, but it's very extensive. And finally, our ranking. Um, and I'm not going to start bragging about it. You can do your own uh, research. The one I'm most proud of is TaxTalent.com has ranked us uh, at the top one or two for like the last three or four years. Anytime any organization says that they're ranked highly, you have to ask, well, why were they ranked highly? Who's doing the ranking? And that's why I'm proud of TaxTalent.com. TaxTalent reaches out to about over 300 recruiters and they ask the recruiters a bunch of questions which uh, revolve around what programs do you rank highly that you want to recruit at and to me if our if the recruiters see us highly then we know we're doing something pretty well um, because they're they're impressed by our graduates um, that all spells out career and to me why you would choose Golden Gate over another, another location is that it, you can feel that, hey, if you get an education here, it's going to either jumpstart your career, start your career, or enhance your career. Um, and we do that not only by the, the technical knowledge, and I'm going to talk about all the technical knowledge you will learn here, but by the end of this presentation, I hope that you will see a whole bunch of things that we do that supplement the technical knowledge you learn in your classroom that's going to help you in the real world. All right, what's our virtual, I'll give you a real quick virtual tour of our San Francisco campus. Most of you are interested in uh, online, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time about it, but we went through a renovation of all our floors about a year and a half, two years ago. Um, it's, uh, there's a lot of meeting area for our students to, uh, to congregate outside the classroom. And the two pictures on the right is inside our classroom. Um, all the desks are movable, so it can be configured any way that we, you want. There's a traditional classroom, which is the bottom right, but also on the top right, uh, it's more of a U shape, which is more conducive to classroom discussion, which is usually how I set up uh, most of my classes. And if you look real closely, you'll see the whiteboard is almost, is is just about 360 around the classroom. So, um, you know, I like it because it's, you can kind of make it have not have a, a front of the classroom. All right, um, what, what, do you, what benefits you get once you have your degree? Um, I said the career uh, acronym, it opens the doors, um, uh, whether it's in public accounting, private industry, which is working in the corporate uh, tax department, or the government, or nonprofits. If you look at, um, I'm going to talk about job placement in a minute, but um, the other thing that I think people don't realize um, after they get completed with their degree is that you develop a, a vast um, professional network. Um, you can develop a network with 
your professors, because I told you before, your professors have usually worked uh, extensively in a career in taxation. Like I said, myself, I've worked 20 years in tax, and I think I have one of the least amount of experiences among the, the full-time tax faculty, um, but also with your fellow students, because you're going you're gonna to meet students who are on various stages of their career, and you're going to receive extensive support and mentoring whether it's with our advisors or our professors. I have a lot of students who come to me during office hours and, uh, and they want to talk to me about career opportunities. They want to talk about their resumes, or their cover letters, or interviews that they're going on. And I'm fine. I welcome that uh, to the extent that students uh, have questions um, relating to career issues. Um, we, we, this slide likes to brag that our students get hired. We have a high job placement at the big four in the accounting firms. Um, this slide becomes very useful in, in looking at our tax alumni, where are they working? It's one of those slides where the bigger the bubble, the more alumni that we have there. Um, so it's not surprising that the big four are really well represented. Uh, here, Ernest & Young, Deloitte, KPMG, and PricewaterhouseCoopers. But we have a lot at the IRS. Um, and um, if you look smaller, we have um, a bunch of alumni at corporate uh, tax departments. Um, so we see Chevron here, um, Wells Fargo, uh, Bank of America, uh, Boeing. And we also have a lot at the mid-tier firms, um, which is, um, let's see, BDO Siemens here, Moss Adams uh, is here, Hood and Strong, Grant Thornton, and so forth. Just wanted to give you a little flavor of where our tax alumni are. Okay, so for most of the time, you're gonna be hearing from Rocco and me, but I thought at least for one minute, I wanted to uh, let you hear from our alumni uh, in this uh, one minute uh, presentation. Being at Golden Gate is like being surrounded by job opportunities because of its location and the financial district. We have professionals from across the board coming into the university to interact with them. They are potential recruiters and it is a gateway to an employment. GPU is definitely more than affecting the university. It's all about application, real life applications, where they take a real life situation they give it to you in class and make to solve the problem. GGU really provides you the analytical ability to look at situations and be able to find the solution. My favorite thing at Golden Gate University would definitely have to be the professors. They have so much knowledge and they're able to tell us their life experiences through the applications of what we're learning. It makes sense and it's also a great motivation factor for me to know that I'm actually going to be using what I'm learning in the real world. All right. So if you were to look on our YouTube page, which is not hard to find, you just go to YouTube and type in Golden Gate University. Uh, and if you browse that channel, it has a lot more videos from our students uh, talking about their experience. Uh, so I highly recommend if you wanted to hear more uh, to go to our YouTube uh, page. All right, let's go into the curriculum. And I wanna focus initially at least on what I call the gold standard, which is the MS taxation degree. There are shorter um, degrees, which less classes that you need to take, uh, which are called graduate certificates. And those are actually the classes which, which often make up the electives that people take uh, in MS taxation. But first, let me talk about the MS taxation degree. So look at it this way. To get an MS in tax degree, you need to get 30 units. Um, and since most of our classes are three units, that's 10 classes. So of the 10 classes, seven are required and three are, have electives. So um, let me go through the seven required classes really quickly. And when I go through this, I hope you'll have an appreciation of the deep, the breadth and deep technical knowledge that you will um, attain once you complete all these classes. So um, let's talk about first the most, I think the most important class in our entire program, which is TA 329 tax research. Um, so 
Look, the Internal Revenue Code is large. How large? Think of the Harry Potter books. There are seven Harry Potter books. Combined, those seven Harry Potter books are not bigger than the Internal Revenue Code. They're not even half the size of the Internal Revenue Code. So the Internal Revenue Code is large. In addition to that, there are regulations which, um, which interpreted that the code and uh, case law. So um, there's a lot to know. No one person, I don't care how experienced they are, could even come close to knowing all the information that's in there. That's what separates an average practitioner versus a really good one, is the ability to effectively and efficiently research. So you're given a situation, you don't know the rule, you don't know the law, you don't know what the answer is, can you quickly research and find what the correct answer is? And that's what that class is all about. Uh, the first two thirds of the class goes a deep dive on how to research the, the code, case law, how to research electronically. And then it talks about how to document that research, how to write a memo to the file or a, memo, uh, uh, a letter to your client. Um, so that's tax research. Uh, after that, you are ready for TA318, which is individuals. That's a class that I teach that has gone over a big uh, refresh because of the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that was signed into law by President Trump in December. Um, but what this class does is it gives you great practice of getting a set of client facts and having practice on how to uh, apply the law and reach to a logical conclusion. And it's focused on individual taxation. After those two foundational classes, you're ready for the operating rules classes, which is characterization and timing. Characterization is um, determining how uh, income is taxed, whether it's ordinary income and capital or capital gain, um, and how to determine that and what the ramifications are. And then tax timing, another class that I teach, when something is included in income and when something is taken as a deduction. And then a uh, tax procedure, um, which is all about dealing with the Internal Revenue Service. What are your rights as the taxpayer? What can the IRS ask for? And what happens if you disagree with the findings of the IRS? What, what rights do you have as a taxpayer? Finally, your two... Uh, Final um, required classes are deep dive in corporate tax and partnership tax. So after those seven required classes, we, uh, to get the degree, you need to take three electives. A lot of students come to me and say, well, what electives should I choose? And I always say it depends on where you, what your interests lie and how you want to practice. So I worked in a large, always with large corporate taxpayers, and we live in a global environment. So I wanted to take international taxation. International taxation, there is a beginning course, inbound and outbound. Inbound means um, companies are individuals who are foreign who are doing business here in the United States. And it covers outbound, which is U.S. persons or U.S. entities who are doing business abroad. If you're really interested in international taxation, after that class, you can do a deep dive just in inbound, and then another class does a deep dive just in outbound. Um, the other course, which I highly recommend if you're doing corporate taxation, is a, with the internet, almost every company is doing business across state lines. So understanding the rules of multi-state taxation, um, and uh, Kitty Wright is uh, in charge of our multi-state uh, tax courses. If you don't know that name, she's probably the foremost academic expert in the country in multi-state taxation, and she's great. Um, the, um, if you're interested in individual taxation, you're going to want to take classes in estate planning and trust, uh, and we have that as well. All righty. A lot of you mentioned that you have a specific interest in our online program, and I would, I would definitely want to walk you through what it means to take classes here online. So let me tell you what it doesn't mean. What it, or it, it doesn't mean that you need, 
You don't have any campus requirement. You can take, basically you can take everything from Toronto or Dallas, Texas, as I know some of our participants on this call uh, are from. No problem. All of your class participation can be done from your house or workplace. Your taking of exams can be done from home or from your workplace. You just need a quiet place. All advising can be done online. Um, there's never a reason that you have to travel to San Francisco or, or a Seattle campus. Um, the, um, the one thing I want to break the myth, though, is, oh, and also, by the way, let me explain. Um, there is no specific day and time which you need to be online in your online class. Now, some people have taken that to mean, oh, I actually, online is really more self-study. There's not a lot of interaction. That couldn't be farther from the truth. So here's the way I want you to think about our online class. If you take a class in the evening, you will be in class for two hours and 40 minutes in a physical classroom with your classmate. When you're online, you need to spend two hours and 40 minutes online with your classmates. Now, it isn't all done in one day. It's usually spread over the week. So I always tell my online students, they should plan, plan to be in class, in an online class for about 30 to 45 minutes, five days a week. When they do it, completely up to them. They can do it in the morning. They can do it on their commute as long as they're not driving. If they're taking subway, that's okay. Uh, they can do it during their lunch hour. They can do, it doesn't matter. End of the day, whatever. But what happens, the magic of what happens online is, um, so uh, let me, let me kind of show you a typical uh, week. This is, you're looking at a week from my online class. Um, so I start, I open the week. It starts on a Sunday. And every Sunday morning, you know that you can log on and you'll see my ob learning objectives for the week and the actual assignment, which means what readings do I want you to do and what problem sets do I want you to work on, okay? I post my lecture notes, and then every instructor has some type of lecture component. It's the same lecture that I would give in an in-person class. So I do a video screencast. And in that video screencast, um, and by the way, I will be teaching TA318 online in the, uh, in the spring. So some of you guys, if you are taking TA318 in the spring, you'll be able to see all this uh, in my 318 class. But anyway, um, it has a video screencast. And theoretically, you would watch that probably early in the week, Sunday or definitely Monday. Um, then the rest of the week is going to be the discussion forums. The discussion forums, I always break up with problem sets or case studies. So what I ask students to do is to log on or into the discussion forum and offer their answer to the different case studies and problem sets. And I will reply to that. Uh, and then students will reply to that and there'll be a discussion. I always tell my students it's unacceptable and I won't get a good class participation grade if you just log on at the end of the week because it's not a discussion. A discussion has to be a back and forth. So I need uh, students to log in Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And what I tell my students is, guess what? You get Friday and Saturday off. Um, no one needs to participate in the discussion forums during that because what happens on Friday is at the end of the week, there's a quiz. That's kind of a, it's not a very large part of their grade, but it's enough to keep people interested. And it kind of confirms what we learned for the week. Uh, and then I release the homework solutions at the end of the week so they all know what the final answer was. And then it all starts over again on Sunday for the new week. So that kind of takes you through a week, just quick summary. Starts with a lecture, starts with the learning objectives, and then the meat of the week, which is usually Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, is the discussion forums, replying back and forth. Um, and, uh, and then at the end of the week, we release the homework and we have the quiz. And again, please note, if there's any questions on any of this, Please uh, note it, and I will uh, cover it at the end of the, the, uh, the session today. All right. Um, kind of how does uh, the administration part of the, the program happen? Um, so we have 
classes, if you're talking about evening and online, and when I asked everyone, it was always evening or online, um, we have a spring, summer, and fall semester. You can begin any semester you want. You can take a semester off. That's okay. Um, I personally had a very busy, when I was taking classes here, a very busy spring. So I always took a class in the fall and a class in the, uh, the summer. The other thing is there's flexibility between online and evening. Um, you may, for example, uh, I had a student who lived in San Francisco. So they took classes in the evening in San Francisco, but then they uh, were doing a lot of traveling for their work. So they started they the next semester, they took classes online and that's fine. You can go back and forth. Um, and uh, so what's, What's most noteworthy now is our fall semester term is just about to begin. In fact, it begins next week. Um, Rocco will talk more. Even though registration opened way back in the beginning of July, um, it isn't too late if you want to try to register and enroll in classes uh, for fall, but you want to get on that immediately, and Rocco can talk more about that. Um, I'm going to really quickly talk about cohort. Um, just in case someone's interested for next year's cohort, but it is going on now. So these are dates for 2018. Um, the next cohort program wouldn't start until uh, basically these dates in 2019. So July, in the July of 2019. What is cohort? Just in case you hear people talk about it. That's a full-time intensive program. So you wouldn't want to be working. You wouldn't want to be doing anything else. And it is only offered in person in San Francisco. But it's a group of students. We have 19 students this year, and they go through these classes together. So right now, they're all taking uh, the tax research class, the individual class, and the tax proper, the property transactions class. And uh, that keeps them pretty busy. Uh, those three classes, and it's, and it's accelerated. Uh, so so um, And then the next term, uh, term two, they take three more required classes. So just between the end of July and before the Christmas break, they would have completed six of the 10 classes. So you can kind of get a sense of how the program is accelerated. All right, um, I am going to, um, to talk a little bit uh, about some of these professional events and I'm gonna get Rocco Lamana involved. Rocco, last time I let you pick first. I'm picking first this time. So- This is uh, like uh, Hollywood Squares or Jeopardy or something. Yeah. So. Remember, I said at the very beginning that I hope at the end of this presentation, you will see that when I say that this GGU can help you in your career, that it's more than just the technical knowledge and in your classes. We do a lot of things to help supplement that technical knowledge uh, that will help you in the real world. Some of that comes from our professional events. And uh, I am going to pick and choose to talk about the Lunch and Learn series. Um, which I am responsible for. So the Lunch and Learn series, which um, is on your top left part of your screen, um, only happens in the fall and is about 40 different sessions. There are some technical sessions where we, come, we cover FAS 109, we cover read escrow statements. They're usually only one hour. Um, and uh, um, and uh, we have someone coming in talking about common M1s. We had something about the Affordable Care Act, so some hot topics, technical topics we, we, we cover uh, in the Lunch and Learn sessions. We also cover job search skills. We do resume writing, cover letters, uh, interview uh, skills, and we also do technology skills. We just had one on Excel, what are the Excel skills that you use in the tax uh, world, um, and tax compliance, uh, actually preparing an actual tax return. All of these sessions... Um, some of them are taught by our faculty and me, but a majority of them are taught by um, people in the field who come in and uh, they see it as a recruiting event to meet our students, but it's also our opportunity to, to share uh, what's going on currently in the real world uh, on these specific topics. Um, a lot of you are not in Northern California, so you may be going, whoa, wait a minute, can I take advantage of this? Um, you can't attend live but every one of our sessions are recorded. So you can watch a recording of these sessions 
um, uh, and get access to the materials like the slide deck and all that. So with that, I turn it over to Rocco to talk about another one of uh, the professional events on our slide. Well, I'll choose the lower left corner for Braden Leadership Speaker Series for 500 points. <laughs> uh, this event actually starts next Tuesday, and I'm going to share with you a link that you can register, whether you're a student or not, uh, to attend these noontime leadership events. You will also see on the website when you click on the link of uh, all of our speakers that will be presenting throughout this the fall term so the leadership series is a really unique opportunity for you as a as an audience member to engage with uh leaders leaders who have kind of paved the way learned from lessons in life about what does it mean to be a leader and they're sharing that information with you uh, you can see that we're going to start off with Carol Sasaki, who is an inspirational and motivational leader. Uh, and she helps you kind of figure out who you are and how do you put yourself out in that world as a future leader. Leadership skills, regardless of what industry or where the presenter is coming from, uh, are transferable skills. So they are not all tax and accounting professionals. They may have a connection to the field but they may not have their primary experience uh, and what brought them into the current position from you know, the tax and accounting profession. So you're gonna have an opportunity to attend these remotely or in person. If you're attending remote, it's going to be much like what we're doing today. It'll be via Zoom. Uh, and you get to participate and learn from these actual leaders and ask questions, which is a really great opportunity for you to engage. So I hope to see that you're there. You'll see all the presenters on the link. I just put it in the chat box. So feel free to click on it, download it, whatever, when you have time and uh, find with the presenters that you wanna attend. There's a registration link. Uh, and this is a great way to get some leadership uh, opportunities and you might be even able to use them for CPE credit if that's of importance to you. Thanks, Rocco. Um, the, the other event that I love talking about is our business practice lunch, which is the bottom right. Um, it actually occurs on the same day as the career fair. So by nature, you can't really participate if you are, uh, if you're not in, if you don't come live, but um, they are on the same day. So it might not be a bad idea to the extent that you are, if you're looking for a job to maybe take a visit to the Bay Area during that time if, if you're at the point where you're looking for a job. What the Business Practice Luncheon does is, and it's, uh, it's attended by, I'd say over 40 firms. What you do is you literally, you start with like a mixer. So you get a chance to, to, to talk to, to people as you're standing up, which is great practice for uh, networking. And then you sit down and have dinner. Usually the, the, the table is six people, three students and three uh, professionals. And at the end of lunch, the three professionals leave and they will write comments about you. What did you do well? What can you improve on? Uh, and then it's like, a, I don't know, speed dating in the sense that they move tables <laughs> and then you get three different professionals for breakfast, for, for, uh, for dessert and then they evaluate you as well. Um, so it's a good chance to actually really network. They call it a practice, but you are really meeting people in the field, but also learning from the experience. So when uh, you're doing it later, you can be even better. Rocco? Well, as uh, Eric already mentioned, career fair happens on the same day. And many of those uh, professionals will be at the career fair representing their firms or at least their firms will be there if they themselves are not. Uh, so this is a great way for you to, again, network and uh, hopefully find connections for future employment opportunities. The career fair is attended by about 35 to 40 employers. So this is really like speed dating, and Eric made reference to that. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, employers there. One of the questions we typically get is, are these recruiters recruiting for the Bay Area? And primarily they are, but not exclusively. So as many of these firms have offices throughout the country and in other parts of the world, 
uh, they could refer you to different uh, recruiters. Most of the recruiters are kind of regionalized, and so they'll be recruiting for a region like the Bay Area. But that doesn't mean that they would not refer you to uh, their counterparts in other areas of the country if you're interested. I know that some of our students have found internship and job opportunities working with some of these firms in other parts of the country. So that is an option for you if you decide you want to be able to attend. Again, as Eric said, this is an in-person, both of these events are in-person and it's hard to attend if you can't be here in person. However, our Office of Career Planning, who sponsors the career fair along with us, um, is very good at posting job opportunities on their Office of Career Planning job posting website, which you will have access to as an employee or as a student. So therefore, you'll see all of the postings, whether they're for the Bay Area or other parts of the country, and those that come up even after the career fair has ended. So these are four large professional events that we do every fall season, but these are not only the events. There are many off more that we do, uh, not necessarily from this office, but with the Office of Career Planning, who funds a lot of these uh, networking op opportunities and employer relation opportunities. Okay, thanks, Raka. Um, so in addition, uh, Rocco just talked about the Office of Career Planning. I am blown away by all the different resources they have, and I remind students all the time to try to take advantage of it because they, uh, they have just tons and tons of videos and uh, different tools that can help you through the uh, uh, recruiting process. Over on the bottom right of your screen was just eight examples of uh, presentations, uh, video presentations. Uh, that that they offer. Uh, in addition, uh, the graduate advising, uh, you'll be assigned an advisor. Uh, so that's someone that can help you decide which courses to take and how many to take given what's going on in your life. Uh, there are both tax and accounting tutors. Uh, both the advisors and the tutors um, are available via Zoom, which is what we're using now. So you can take advantage that like the, the tutors and um, are have office hours. So you can meet them in person in San Francisco or um, even if you're in San Francisco, if you if it's hard for you to get to campus in the middle of the day during their office hours, you still can um, can uh, can zoom into them and, uh, and and talk to them via video conference. This doesn't replace the fact that your your fact your uh, your professor often has office hours, but this is just another resource uh, for you. Um, the other things on here are important as well as relation to networking. The both the tax club and accounting club helps you connect with fellow students. Um, everything in relation to financial aid, you should definitely see the financial aid department on. And wellness resources is a great. If you, I mean, you're going into tax, and if you don't know how to deal with stress, uh, you're going to need to know how to deal with stress. So uh, wellness resources are, are, are great for that, and you should take advantage of that if that's something that interests you. Um, Rocco, I have a question for you. All these support services and these professional events, uh, how much is this going to cost me? Well, you're going to have to write a fairly large check because it's, Zero dollars, zero dollars. That's how large the check is. Okay, thank you, Rocco. These are free resources to all of our active students. Yes, so all these, you know, another way to put it, it's included in your tuition, right? So whether it's the tuition, whether it's the tutoring or Office of Career Planning or any of our lunch and learns and all that, uh, we even throw in uh, the, uh, the sandwiches if you're attending live uh, for, for free. Okay. Um, if you are a veteran, um, uh, please know that um, we offer a ton of military benefits. Um, so you're going to want to see our financial aid department to make sure that you uh, uh, take advantage of all of the benefits we have for our military. Um, Rocco, um, please talk about the fact that we have set up some proficiency requirements. Um, Specifically, if you have not graduated from a U.S. college, you want to talk about that? Yeah, so um, in response to a lot of the feedback that we received from our employers, which is a group of people that we pay close attention to, they help guide us on a lot of different uh, avenues of helping our students get placed. Uh, but 
two of the things that they really were adamant about is making sure that our graduates have effective writing skills. And so in response to that, we put in the graduate writing proficiency requirement. Uh, there are several ways of, uh, of waiving this requirement. One is if you've graduated from a US university or from a college uh, or university in an English speaking country, then uh, that would uh, qualify for a waiver. There's other ways of waiving these requirements that can be found on our website if you search graduate writing, writing proficiency. Uh, business proficiency is a requirement that uh, underlines the need for understanding US business practices. So our students are required to understand the fundamentals of business. Uh, and if you've worked in the United States for at least two years, uh, you will have uh, satisfied that requirement. Again, there's a few other ways of satisfying that requirement, including graduating from the university here in the United States. Um, so you can look at those business requirements, business and graduate requirements. These are not requirements for admissions. Uh, these are after you're admitted that you need to demonstrate these proficiencies. The language requirement is a requirement for students who are graduating from a university outside the United States or are, are international students. And so that's the ELR, English language requirement. Um, and those are usually satisfied through scoring, a uh, high, high enough score through either IELTS or a TOEFL exam. And again, you can go to our website to see all of the ways you would satisfy these proficiencies. The application process is not that cumbersome. Um, there are some requirements that we ask of our students or our prospective students is that you have at least a 3.0 GPA in your undergraduate degree. We would need the official degree and we don't require a GMAT or GRE. However, if you are below a 3.0, you can still apply. There are a few other requirements that we would ask for you to satisfy. Um, if you are below a 3.0, uh, we ask for a statement of purpose and a resume. This helps us put an understanding around what happened while you were in undergraduate school and what caused you to fall below a 3.0 and what has changed and what can you do to be successful. Uh, if you are applying for the cohort program, then we would request a statement of purpose and a resume, uh, letters of recommendation. Uh, but as Eric may have mentioned, uh, we do not open up registration for or enrollment for the cohort program until uh, late November or December of this year for the 2019 uh, season. Uh, if you're an international student or graduated from a university outside the United States, you will need to pro provide us a TOEFL or IELTS score. Um, and I believe I, oh, if you have a, if you graduated from a university and have a graduate degree, although we don't require it, we do request that you send those, especially if you're below a 3.0 uh, and you've graduated with a 3.0 or higher in your graduate degree, this will help us in understanding your ability to be successful in another graduate program. Financial aid, and how do you pay for your degree? We do offer financial aid. Uh, if you qualify, there's different ways of, uh, of applying for financial aid. The best way to learn about what your situation is and how that and how you might uh, be able to apply for financial aid is to contact our Office of Financial Aid uh, at the email below. You can also go to the FAFSA website, which is indicated here, and uh, fill out a FAFSA so that a, our financial aid department uh, would know more about your financial history and can help you in guiding you towards the types of programs that you might be eligible for to pay for college. There's also state aid, and there's also grants and scholarships that you might qualify for, as well as private and alternative loans. And if you're an employer, um, employer does reimbursement, please take advantage of that, because gosh, let's you know use that money, because the knowledge and experience you learn in your program comes back tenfold to their, to their benefit. So these are some of the ways you can pay for your university uh, experience. Uh, for more information, I highly encourage you to go to the website below, uh, the financial aid department, and then also connect with somebody there to ask uh, questions. What is the cost? Uh, the cost is $3,600 per three unit course. All of our courses are three units in the school of tax, um, semester units that is. Uh, there are 10 courses, so it's $3,600, th excuse me, uh, $36,000 
for just the 10 courses uh, for tuition only. And then there are other fees. Uh, we do have a $1,000 cohort fee, but this would not necessarily apply to you unless you're going to wait until next year to apply for the cohort. Uh, there are out discounts available. If you're only auditing a course, it's a third off the cost of tuition, uh, so you only pay two-thirds. The, there is no academic credit awarded, though, and this is for only uh, domestic students. International students, I don't believe, can audit courses. Uh, there's an application fee also, $40 if you're applying for a certificate program, $70 for our graduate degree, and if you're international, it's a $110 application fee, which we will waive today because you are uh, attending this. And I'm going to put in the waiver code right now in the chat box. Um, one moment, I guess I can't talk and type at the same time, so you'll have to forgive me. So the waiver code when you're applying is TAXACCT18, all caps. And that will waive any of the application fees only, no other fees. Uh, the deadlines, we're on a rolling uh, trimester. So we have fall, spring, and summer. Fall, fall term op opens up uh, Sunday, the 26th. Um, registration opened in July. So we've been registering students uh, for quite a few uh, weeks. If you are thinking about starting for the fall term, open enrollment might be the way for you to start. It's the easiest way to start in the program uh, while you're trying to put all the documents together for your application. When you're in the application form, you can uh, indicate that you want open enrollment. Also, Chi, so, uh, excuse me, Chi, Chu, uh, I have a friend named Chi, Chu, uh, so kindly put in the information in our chat box about where to find out how to apply for open enrollment and the process for it. And Chu is also on the line, is our admissions advisor, and she can um, be a point of reference. Um, if you, we have priority deadlines. So 15 days before the class begin is August 3rd, so that has already passed. Uh, those are the priority deadlines so that you'll get a class. Uh, there's also a requirement that if you need to take the graduate writing proficiency, uh, that you do that in, in advance so that you know what courses you need before this, the term starts. So, uh, so you want to take at least the exams be 10 days before, uh, business days before the start of the term. All right, so I want to open it up to folks, but I, 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 I remember all the questions that um, I was, was asked, and I, I think there was one I didn't uh, directly answer, I think, to hear asked. And I think it was how much time uh, it, it, to, it, it takes for each course. It depends on the person and your level of experience. Remember, I said two hours and 40 minutes is the actual time that you meet in class. And that's either physically in an in-person class or throughout the week participate in discussion forums. In addition to that, I would say 10 to 12 hours. Okay. So uh, for a regularly scheduled not accelerated class. So that means, you know, uh, you're looking at about 13 to 15 hours counting class time. Also, okay. I'd just like to do a quick shout out to David Keller and Filippo Amoroso and Nari Yoon for joining us late, later, uh, but we're welcoming you. And so if you have questions, feel free to unmute yourself and ask the question or type it in the chat, chat box uh, in case you didn't get those instructions earlier. Please feel free to, um, I, you know, show us your face by doing your video. Uh, David Keller asked, for alumni after the program, are there are some of the services available? So yes, there are, these services are available for our alumni in most cases. Maybe not all of the events, but most of the events are. Plus, you have access to Office of Career Planning. And if you come back and take a course, you do get a discount uh, for alumni discount. So that's a great way to continue your education even after you've graduated from your program, your master's degree. So if, this, if there are any other questions, again, unmute yourself, ask them, or um, ch uh, just chat them in the box, and I can read them out loud and then respond, or Eric will respond. And for most of the session, it really isn't, wasn't necessary. But at the end here, as you guys are asking questions, feel free to share your screen. Love to see you. Uh, and um, we, we, will, we have another 10 minutes, but Rocco and I can stay later to the extent there's still questions. 
So Don asks, are class materials usually available online for the whole duration of the course? Uh, so if you're an online student, I would say yes. Um, sometimes the professors will um, shade out the modules that have already completed, but I believe those resources are ac uh, accessible still. Eric, do you want to add Yeah, on? so a lot of times just for focus, um, like if your class opens, I only will show you week one. And then when we get to week two, I'll show you week one and week two. So um, you won't see all 15 weeks on the first day, most classes. But when you're in week 15, you will see all of the, all of the materials for the entire class. I did have one other question. Sure, yeah. David. So when I'm looking at, say, some of the electives and recognizing uh, which ones are probably ideal, do we have to make a decision up front as we begin the course, or I should say the program in electing which ones we're going to? And can we change them, say, if it's going to be spread out over two years, the program that we're doing? So I will. Uh, attempt to answer that first and then Eric feel free to add on to it. Um, so the elective courses rotate. They're not always offered each term. Uh, what we really recommend is students work on their core courses. There's 10 courses in the uh, MST degree. So the first seven are your program core courses. Uh, so you do you want to chip away on those core courses before you start into taking electives primarily because most of those courses or some of those core courses are prerequisites for the electives. And so electives are just electives. You can take anything you want that's available during the term that you want to take that. So if you're interested in international, for example, TA321, which is the introductory course, is the first in the suite, and then you would want to take that. Um, or if it's estate planning, you know, like TA344, I believe, is the first one in that uh, section of of uh, courses. You can look on the website and look at, like, say, the certificates, for example, like there's a certificate in international tax. So if that was something you're interested in, you could see all the courses that are offered in international tax. Again, they're not offered every term. And then you can also go to the course catalog on the website to see all of the courses that we offer uh, beyond just the core courses. So I want to chime in as well on that response. So yeah, the direct answer is you're not committed to your elective until the day you register yeah. for it but i think it's a great idea to plan ahead now that can change you you know when, when i took classes i thought you know i talked to people i worked with and tried to figure out what would be most useful um and then i had a whole bunch of client changes <laughs> and all of a sudden like you know what i was you know was thinking of doing this class but now i'm going to change and do that other class Here's my belief about education. I think education is always most powerful when you're able to apply what you learn shortly after. So it's always great to take an elective and then shortly after have client issues related to that where you can apply. Mm -hmm. um, there was one last piece of a question, at least when it comes to um, maybe even after the program or say a year into it and for applying it to say our clients or our type of work that we do for our company, wanting to find out at least what's the feedback you've received and say professors being available to support their students after the program or during it once the actual course has been completed. Say um, multi-state sales and use tax. Mm -hmm. Being able to provide that input or a, a, maybe a a sound bar of like, all right, hey, this is what I'm thinking. Does this sound right? Rather than us having to turn to, say, consultants at a big four firm who are very much looking at, all right, we're going to be clocking you for uh, an hour's worth of time for research for your behalf or something like that. You know, so, that direction. Okay, great question. So, um, so I think it depends on what the question is. Of course. I think when the question is on point to something I covered, Right, that, that that was related to our class. Exactly what I'm uh, it, it, Then uh, I'm happy to do that. Now, what I always am careful with is we're not giving advice, right? We're not. We have to be very careful. So we'll we'll like you said, kind of as a sounding board. 
how to give you some frame of reference. I've had students come to my office hours, uh, former students come to my office hours, um, the, uh, and, and ask questions. Uh, probably what some instructors might uh, be, you know, wouldn't want to get like a, a laundry list of, of or emails, right? You know, of all this. But if it was just like a concept and they, they like gave what their thoughts were and they said they're bouncing off, what do you, does this make sense? I think that would be fine. Yeah, and I think in addition to what you had asked, many of our professors have, you know, forged strong relationships with students who have graduated and now are alumni, and they come back and they connect on doing, talking about different topics or issues that they're dealing with. And again, they, they have to be careful not to provide advice because that's not their role, but to guide you and perhaps giving you some thoughts and ideas of how to better support you and in finding your answers to your questions. Um, to hear asks, uh, I'm a qualified CPA from Illinois and have tax courses at graduate level from University of Illinois. Are there waivers available? So we don't really provide waivers. Uh, there are transfer credits that are available, uh, but that determination would have to be made based on the courses that you've taken, graduate level again, and uh, the faculty review it and make decisions of whether they're equivalent to our any of the courses in our program. Um, so there's a process for uh, submitting your syllabi and requests. Uh, there's a form you can fill out and we can review that and make a determination. You can transfer up to six units in from an outside university. Um, so I just want to underscore that we, we, don't, we're not, we are uninterested in having you take a class that's just a repeat of something that you exactly that you've done. But we also believe that all our classes are very important to ascertain that technical knowledge. So sometimes a student may take in a, take in a class that just doesn't go anywhere near the depth that one of our classes. There's some overlap, but there is a lot that is not covered. And in that situation, we tell the students, you know, you don't qualify, you still have to take the class. It's not because we want to be mean, it's because we want to make sure people get the technical material out of the, uh, that they should get out of a master's in tax here. And then Vivian asks, how does tutoring work for online uh, for the online program? So tutors are here in person, but they're accessible via Zoom, the same tool that we're using today. So during their office hours, you can uh, definitely connect with them via Zoom. The information will be found in your course shell where all of your online courses will be held. There will be a schedule for each term and then how to connect with them by clicking on the link during their office hours. So you will have access to them, just not in person, but remotely like we are doing today. And these students, uh, these tutors are all alumni. And these are? Some of them are alumni and some of them are current students, but have oh, the okay. majority of the program. Currently, they're all alumni, but we've had some current students as well. You guys are asking great questions. Yeah, great. Other questions? Hey, Eric, did you address um, how relevant our current curriculum is to the tax changes of TCJA? Uh, I briefly talked about how TA318 has greatly changed. Uh, it was very painful for yours truly here mm -hmm. uh, because I was responsible for uh, updating that. Um, but, you know, international tax had, a t had a equally a, a lot of changes. Um, and that's already been incorporated in all of our uh, classes. It's a great time to be taking classes uh, because everybody's getting up to speed. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Section 199A, but that's complex. Yeah, there was some simplification that was done here, but there was also some great complexity that was added. And um, people are just now in the real world getting their hands around it. Why? Because the Tax Act started in December of 2019, was signed into law, but it was effective um, for, uh, for the first time in, uh, um, well, for, it depends on the provision, but in 2017 or 2018. And if it's 2000, even if it's 2017, the, 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 the returns are done at the end of 2018, it's on extension. So anyway, other a questions? Is, a lot of work has gone into updating the curriculum to reflect that. Yes. That's all you were looking for me to say, right? No, no. <laughs> More details are better, but I just simplify. 
What other questions do you guys have? I know it's the top of the hour at one o'clock. We're willing to stay on a few more minutes if needed to answer questions. So if you have questions that weren't already answered, please ask them. If you had to choose one class outside of the elective uh, TS-32 2B, which was, oh no, TA-356, I know that was highly recommended. Is there one other one that you would suggest that we should keep on our radar just as, hey, personally, from feedback of alumni, this is one course that you stand out from any other MST program? Well, I think that it kind of goes back to what Eric said is what are your, what are your interests or what kind of work are you doing or planning to do in the field? And Absolutely. Having those classes that are guided to that. Choice of entity TA356 is a great class because, and especially with the tax uh, changes, uh, is how do you align your um, business organ your organization? You know, is it an S corp or is it a partnership or what? What does that entity look like for you? And what are the implications from a tax perspective for your client? Um, so that's one course that we highly recommend because it becomes useful in a lot of different ways. And regardless of what whether you're doing international or not, so it kind of is a topic that you know that spans all of the types of areas that most of our students will go into. Um, but Eric, do you have one to add on to that? Yeah, I agree with, you're agreeing with me earlier that it does depend on what your area, but if you told me, look, I don't know the area, then I would say, um, because I think it has such broad applicability in our, our world, that we live in a global economy, we live in a multi-state economy, is those two classes. I think it's a real, I, I took our beginning, our uh, international tax. Uh, I, I worked, and you know, I was in in the field, I worked in corporate tax. We, anytime there was a complex international tax issue, it always went to our international tax department. We have a big international tax department. But it was so valuable to understand the basics of international tax. So when, the, when there's a discussion, I could basically understand the, the issues and the concepts, and that, that's pretty valuable. That, and I think multi-state, um, knowing basic, uh, rules about what causes nexus in states and uh, I think is really important as well. Perfect. Oh, great question, David. Here's one last one then. What it, what's your thought on that uh, TA 39.6X, which is the tax accounting for vineyards and wineries? So we haven't offered that course in a very long time. In fact, I don't know the last time we've offered it. Eric might know. Um, we're ha we have a problem in finding somebody that can really teach that course that has the extensive background in the, the wine industry. Uh, but I believe, yeah, I don't know when the, they've taught that last. Gotcha. It's, that very, it's, it's a very specialized uh, course. Yeah. I'm going to Gala Winery. That's why. So I'm just yeah. saying. Uh, I'm sorry, what'd you say? I'm coming from Gala Winery. Oh, okay. So that's why I'm curious to see about that one also. That one's a spike to low interest, but yeah. So anyway. Well, I think you should talk to your advisor. I think as far as that's an interest of yours and, you know, our issue always is not only finding the right person to teach a course, but to make sure that there's interest, right? We don't really run courses as two people in the, yeah. in the, in the class, but. Well, we had a student, I uh, recall, maybe a year and a half ago, uh, indicate interest in that class. And I was working with the dean trying to figure out if we had any talent in our, in our current pool of adjunct at the time who have that kind of background. And there, I don't think we found anybody that had that background. Not to say that we wouldn't find somebody or couldn't come across somebody, it's a possibility that you might even do an independent study option for that course, nice. uh, but we would have a directed study. We would have to have that discussion, but that would be closer to the end of your program. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you. Well, we are now five after. I'm not too sure if the questions have slowed down or not, um, but if you have any, please ask now and then, 
Um, I will be sending out this recording and um, a copy of the PowerPoint either later today or by tomorrow with also the uh, discount, excuse me, the um, waiver information for the application fee so that you have that also when it comes time for you to apply. So Rocco, I have a question. Yes. I think we briefly talked about it earlier. If they're interested in the fall, what should they do and when should they do it? <laughs> do it now. <laughs> Don't hesitate. Uh, in the chat box uh, earlier, uh, Chi provided, I said Chi again. I think of my friend Chi. Uh, Chu provided um, information on open enrollment. And let me just, copy it and I'm going to put it in the chat box again for everybody to see because it'll be so you won't have to search so far. Uh, so open enrollment would be your best option to get started right away uh, and then uh, maybe shoot me an email to let me know that you've completed the application and open enrollment so we can so I can work with you to, to see where we can how we can move your application forward but that would be the quickest and easiest way. Uh, so from a professor's standpoint, you don't want to start, you don't want to miss the first week of class. Right. Absolutely no. not. And you know, I didn't ask David or Filippo if they were planning to attend, uh, in per or Nari, if they were planning to attend in person or online, uh, but online, you know, it opens up Sunday, the 26th. And if you're doing in person, uh, so David is online. Um, uh, so in person though is Monday through Thursday. We don't have Friday classes. Uh, so we would want you to get started right away if you're gonna do it in person. Online, you have the greater part of the week to do your assignments, but you don't wanna to wait till the last minute and be overwhelmed or trying to get all the stuff done before the end of the first module. All righty, looks like uh, we've got all the questions. Well, I wish you guys well. Thanks for participating. This is a great group. You guys have some really good questions. Uh, just know that we're here to the extent that you have additional questions down the road and wish you well in your tax journey. Thank you, everybody. And we'll hope to see you around somewhere soon. Bye-bye.